Welcome to the worst nightmare of all. Reality. Explore the lesser known stories of our unknown world. Join the pursuit of the paranormal with Ash and Greg. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. I came across your account on Twitter and I've watched the one of the Dorothy is at documentaries. But before we get to how Dorothy is at came about for you, how did you get into the whole UFO, paranormal, um, Bigfoot type arena? We like to just cover it all as paranormal on this podcast. Well, but what started your fascination and how did you get to today, basically? Well, I started out as a child. <laughs> Same here. <Wow. laughs> so did we all. We all. I started out, uh, actually, when I was in high school, there was a lot of information coming out. Saga UFO report. There were all kinds of different things. Nothing, nothing, anything like there is now. But whatever there was, I wanted to hear about. And I was also into astronomy. I would go out with my with my telescope and look at the gaze at the, at the stars and look at the moon. And, and I was into being outside. And while I was outside doing a lot of this, I would see things in the sky that I couldn't explain. Wow. And of like course, what? talking about that with anybody was was verboten, you know, you, you mention it and they think you're totally off your, off your rocker, you know? So it's like, I continued to research and, and looked at, into that kind of stuff all the way through high school. And I got interested in Bigfoot sightings because there were sightings in Oklahoma. There were sightings in Texas and believe it or not, there have been sightings in Kansas. Okay. And Sasquatch. I know that's a tough one to swallow, but there have been sightings around Wichita. They've seen they've seen it along the freeway eating corn. There's been a lot in Nebraska, in Kansas, in Oklahoma, in Texas, all over Missouri, especially in the eastern part of Oklahoma, and down by Missouri and in that area. There have been numerous sightings for many many years. There's stories about a tribe that lived in the Missouri Valley and they were quote unquote, stealing the children and stealing all of the vegetables that the, that the farmers were raising. And they were, it was really putting them at risk. So they got together a group of militia back in the day, it was kind of a, a militia. They got a group together and went out after these creatures and they found a mound, like a like a, a mound that you've seen. I'm sure you've seen some of the mounds that are are in Missouri and various places in in the Midwest. There are they are like a, a large mound that were built yeah. by the yeah you know, okay. So they found a mound that wasn't that large, but these creatures were using that mound to bury the uneaten bodies of people they had kidnapped. Okay. That's, not that's, heard of that. Yeah. I'll tell you, there are not many people that know that story. I, I found that story after after researching it and talking with John Green. I don't know how familiar you are with with the with the Bigfoot lore. John Green is one of the one of the the major UFO Bigfoot journalists in the, in the in America at least, and really around the world. And so I've been written up by John Green in several of his books. In fact, I worked on Harry and the Hendersons. What? That's a great film. Yeah, I worked on that. I thought it was going to be I, when I first got the thing across my desk. I thought I thought like, oh yeah, this this is going to be like Ozzy and Harriet. I didn't understand what it was, and then we started working on it, and I realized, oh wait, this is what I do. I've got to talk to Spielberg and to Rick Baker, who did this, the costume. We've got to get together on this because I, I can put it, I can add a lot to this. And so I worked with Rick Baker on designing the costume. Wow. And 
I worked on the sets and everything else. That was prior to Back to the Future and some of those things that I also worked on with Spielberg. So Okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, that's what I've... See, I've, I've been around this industry when you're a musician like I am, a wild and crazy, wild-eyed musician. You know, uh, <laughs> you've got to do something besides play music to in order to survive. So I got involved in the film industry. I got my one card in the union. So I was able to work on, on any of the studios in, Ca in, in California, in Hollywood, at, at Burbank Studios, at Warner Brothers, at Disney, at Universal, at 20th Century Fox. So I worked around all of the lots. But when I got into Harry and the Hendersons and found out more about what it was, then I really started working closely with, with, with uh, Spielberg. And I actually, if you've seen the movie, it sounds like you have. Have you seen Ash? Ash is I've a bit younger than me. Oh, you haven't seen oh my the movie? God. Harry, oh, you don't. Harry's a you got to see this. Yeah, you Harry's a see Harry and the Hendersons, I'll watch man. It now, I'll watch it. Yeah. That, yo, pick it up. Anyway. It's a great film. If you, if you watch, there is a kind of wild-eyed Bigfoot hunter that's always chasing Bigfoot. He's the one that when he was in the cell, he would, he would move to one side of the cell and everybody in the cell would move to the other side. Yeah. Okay, that's the guy I'm talking about. He was doing research and he had books laying on his desk. The books that you see laying on his desk, written by John Green, are the books that I gave to Spielberg that I haven't gotten back yet. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> and those, I, cool. I was written up in those. So, That's awesome. But, uh, you know, I, one of these days I'm going to get a hold of Spielberg and get those books back because they cost 30 bucks a piece now. He might be listening. You never know. He might <laughs> be listening. <laughs> Steve, if you're listening, I want my books back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, as we were kind of going into where I got into this, so in high school, I was here in a little place called Norton, Kansas. You can look it up. Mm -hmm. At the time, we had 3,500 people living in town. <laughs> oh, everybody farmers and everybody, you know, everybody knew everybody. I couldn't get away with anything. So I was in touch with the people in Willow Creek, California. Al Hodgson, who ran the Willow Creek General Store. Stayed friends with Al Hodgson for many, many, many years. In fact, I recently ran it. I recently saw him when we invited him to be on Finding Bigfoot, the show that, that the guys are doing, you know. Uh, yeah. So I took them up to show them exactly where the sighting had been. And when we were in Willow Creek, we invited Al Hodgson to be on the show. But back to the beginning, Al Hodgson got a hold of me and invited me to come to California because Roger Patterson had just filmed Bigfoot. And Bob Gimlin, of course, who is still a friend to this day. He was also on that Finding Bigfoot show with us. He actually went up to the actual site. But when we were at the site, I was directing Bobo, who's the big guy, you know, on Finding Bigfoot, how to walk because I knew the I knew all of the all of the moves the Bigfoot had made. So I was directing him as to how to walk, look back over his shoulder as he walked across the clearing. But we were at the, we filmed that Finding Bigfoot at the actual site where the first Bigfoot was filmed by Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin. Back in 1967. But I was there. I got there the day after, after they called. I got in my 58 baby blue Ford and drove to California all the way from Kansas by myself. Got there basically the day after the next day. So I was there like a day and a half later. I got there and I made plaster casts of all of the footprints that they got. In fact, if I can get my wife to be a gopher for a minute. I'll have her get a couple of the casts and bring them over to show you. Yeah, yeah, please. They're hiding under the couch in the living room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I've got a gigantic skull and jawbone that you should, teach, should see as well. Yes, so please. 
I'll have her bring those over. She, we can show those to you guys while we're on the Bigfoot thing. Yeah. You know, and then when we go on, we'll, I don't have a UFO. I don't have an alien to show you. Why? Why don't you have an alien? You don't want an alien? You do. No. Why don't you have an alien? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I always thought that with all of the interaction I was having, someday I was going to be abducted. I really thought they're back underneath there. I think. Look in the look in the bedroom then. She's looking under the couch, and we, we moved a bunch of our stuff around. We're remodeling. So welcome cool. to the wonderful world of remodeling. <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway, uh, I'll have her bring the jaw and the and the skull out, and she can look for the Bigfoot prints. But, uh, wow. After... I, can I just interject? Absolutely. So but when we started this podcast, I did not expect us to start talking about Bigfoot casts <laughs> and – skulls and jaws i'll be honest with you that wasn't something that i that i expected based on <laughs> on what i thought we were going to talk about this is great this is well great. you know it all falls together because i sent you a picture of that dorothy took on board a ufo when they allowed her to bring her camera on board okay so which picture you, is that which picture is that it's a picture uh you'll be able to see a bigfoot with a little alien driving the the ufo Oh, is that that? Okay, yeah, yeah. You'll be able to see that. Let me have the big foot, the mandible first. Here's the Bigfoot jaw. Bigfoot wow. jaw. A little larger than yours, isn't it? Just a bit. <laughs> I don't think it'll quite fit in my mouth. No. That's the Bigfoot jaw. And then she'll hand me the, the skull after she finds the, the prince. She's looking for the prince now. Uh, but what's interesting about the prince is that I took those directly from the Patterson footage site. These okay. are the ones that the actual Bigfoot that Patterson filmed made in the clearing on the sandbar. Wow. And nobody has any, you, no, nobody has those. Do you believe that that footage was real? I Absolutely. Absolutely. I know it's a, it's a stretch of the imagination, but when you, here's a, here's the big footprint. Now this will maybe shake you, shake you up. And, uh, I think you'll see how real it is. This is an actual footprint from the Bigfoot film from the sighting. What? Jesus. That's big. So for people listening, we'll try and get a photo of that somehow, but it's, Bigger than a human head, for definite. She's talking 18 and a half inches. She's got the there other go. one here. This is a more natural look. These are both, one from the right foot, one from the left foot. And that's, the actual, see the, sand. that's the actual cast that you took yes. of the big footprint from the Patterson footage. Wow. wow. Yeah, Patterson footage. There at I didn't know there was footprint. There. I'm sorry? I didn't know there was footprints taken, cast from that site. That's amazing. Yeah, I've seen, I've got pictures. I may have sent you some of, of actual footprints that we have taken, that we have gotten. Now I have her bring the, the skull over. And you'll be able to see the size. Now the skull is made from, from portions of Bigfoot skull and teeth that were found in China. So this is the actual skull, the size and shape of the actual Gigantopithecus. Oh. You can see it's got a sagittal crest. The crest yeah. on top is so it can carry that massive jaw. Wow. So that's a pretty good sized critter there. It, scary I, looking. <laughs> yeah. Scary well, big you know, as well. The thing about Bigfoot is that, you know, everybody's oh, they were they were scared to death and they ran off screaming and and you know, they never are going back to the place again. Well, I'm sorry to relate. Bigfoot has never hurt me, and I've been within, I know I've been within 10 feet of one. The okay. other thing that happened to me is that we were up, the sheriff had called us, and we had gone out to find out what was going on at this little little Airstream trailer where this woman lived. 
she was in her trailer and the trailer began rocking back and forth and it freaked her out. So she, she thought it was an earthquake being in California. So she went outside, turned around and looked back at the trailer. And here was a Bigfoot standing there, head and shoulders above her Airstream trailer. So, I mean, from about, from about here, from about here up, this thing was standing over the trailer and rocking the trailer back and forth. That was around, that was in Palmdale. That was a Sycamore Flats. And then later I turned this information over to Bobby Slate, who wrote a book called Sasquatch about all of our experiences out there in the high desert in California. Anyway, that's, I probably blown your minds completely. So I don't, I don't want to yes. do that too much. So if you want to move on to any other thing, that's fine. Yeah. You keep going on. On your journey of how we got up to Dorothy, is that? That would be great. Well, you know, it's funny. My partner, who is having a bit of problems mentally right now, he's he's a little bit older and he's, he's having some dementia difficulties. And he and I used to do these shows all the time together. We'd get on a talk show uh, on a podcast and they just go, hey, you guys take it. You know, you guys have got it. <laughs> if we ever need somebody to do our podcast, we're calling you. Go for it. So, you know, if I get... If I get too wordy, just I've been known to talk people's legs completely off. No, people have come on. to my house. They've come to my house to visit, and I'll talk their legs off, and I have to carry them to the car. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no. Anyway, it's great. It's great. Uh, so all of this happened with the Bigfoot, and when I was doing all of this research, but the way I met Peter Gatilla, who is the the actual physical author of contact with beings of light i was involved doing back to the future in other films and so i wasn't able to sit down and write the way peter was able to do but i'm the one who brought dorothy isaac to our show called sightings sightings is on fox network and i brought uh i brought dorothy onto the show after I had talked with her for three and a half, four months, I mean, Dorothy's family did not believe her. No. And she finally found someone in me that she could talk with. And she was just elated. And so I'd get a call at three o'clock in the morning and we'd talk all night long about the stuff that Dorothy was experiencing because none of her family believed that what she was experiencing was legitimate. They thought that she was off a rocker. The only one that believed her was her, her granddaughter, Jamie, who, thank goodness, has just gotten back in touch with me. We looked for so long to find Jamie. We couldn't find her. Well, she saw the Dorothy Isaac project and got back in touch with us. Now Jamie is going through some things that she needs. We're trying to help her out because she's going through some some rough times, but uh, I think that's going to straighten out for her. We're trying to get her involved more to do some stuff with us. And I actually sent you one of the pictures that Jamie recently sent me. It's kind of a tall uh, figure, a single individual figure, kind of a, a blue toned picture that Dorothy or that uh, Jamie actually sent me recently. She had that saved from her days with Dorothy. But then, so w back in the day when I was working for the Navy doing my photo analysis, Stanton Friedman got a hold of me. Wow. So I'm sure you know Stan. And Stan introduced me then to Alan Hynek. Okay. And all of us, Stanton Friedman, Alan Hynek, Ray Stanford, all of the people kind of would come to us and we kind of had a hub around us that, where we worked through all this Bigfoot stuff and all the, all of the UFO stuff. But Stan Friedman told us one time, he said, don't confuse me with more than one issue at a time. <laughs> <laughs> the UFO is, is bad enough without, without the Bigfoot stuff too. Well, as you probably all know, there have been sightings that are, that correspond, that are linked 
UFO and Bigfoot sightings together. So it was one phenomenon. It wasn't just, it wasn't totally individual. And the Indians, the Native Americans have always said that the Bigfoot was dropped from shiny moons. And the Native Americans were told to take care of the Bigfoot because it was keeper of the forest. So, and, and the Native Americans also say that the Bigfoot has one foot in, in each world. So they say it a foot in both worlds is how they say it. So I don't know if you know who Ron Moorhead is. He's a Bigfoot researcher. You do? Okay, Ron Moorhead and Al Berry were working on that book, Sasquatch, with Bobby Slade and myself. Well, they screwed us around. Ron Moorhead didn't, but Al Berry did. We gave him all the information for the book, and then he ran off with it and, and really messed us around. And, and that's that was kind of a, a bad taste in our mouth. But Ron Moorhead has been very cool, and he's got a thing out called Sierra Sounds. Sierra Sounds is incredible. If you're interested in Bigfoot at all, you really should listen to Sierra Sounds because it's a Bigfoot talking back and forth with them in the okay. high Sierras, and it is really good. And they've looked at that, they've analyzed it, and the ones who have analyzed it say there is no way that a human could be making those sounds. It would require a voice box, you know, as big around as a, as a Bigfoot's throat, not a human's throat, to make those sounds. But that's something you should really check out. It's really, it's really worth listening to. And then Ron Moorhead did a thing called Quantum Bigfoot, which talks about the other aspects of Bigfoot, which are quote-unquote quantum. And that's why very possibly Bigfoot will disappear in a burst of light. And very possibly why we can't follow one for very far because they always end up disappearing. So I think there's something to it being a quantum entity, not just a physical animal. And of course, I don't think it's an animal. If it were, it's not an animal. It's more like a human. Anyway, that's where that kind of connects with everything that, that I do with the UFO and everything else. And during one thing I should mention that when Stanton Friedman and Alan Hunting and all of us were working together, Peter Gatilla and I are the ones that told Stan Friedman about the Roswell incident. And so then Stan, of course, I'm doing film, okay? I'm, I'm working in film 24-7, so my days are crazy. And I just basically handed all this information, found him some witnesses, and then kind of handed it over to Stanton, and Stanton took off and, and wrote the book. So that's where that all, that's how that all evolved. I, by the way, I just got back in touch with Paul Hynek, who was Alan's son. Okay. And I said, you know, I remember talking to some tiny voices when I was calling Alan all the time. And he goes, hmm, I've never been called a tiny voice before, but yeah, that was me. We were... We were UFO Central. We were the ones that answered all the phone calls. And his wife, Mimi, was, was a good friend. Have you seen Project Blue Book? The, the series. Uh, yeah, the series. Yeah, yeah. Well, Paul Hynek was advisor on that. And they took a little bit of liberty. You know, they made it kind of like they all do. I'm a friend of Travis Walton's, if you know Travis Walton. You know, the... The guy who was abducted in, in uh, okay, well, in Cottonwood. Anyway, they took liberties with his film, with that film, that he was very unhappy with. He was not in this organic type atmosphere. He was in a pristine medical room type atmosphere, not the way they did Fire in the Sky. They just, they just made it weird. I don't know about you, but when I watched it, I just I didn't I was very uncomfortable with the whole thing. That wasn't the way it happened. Anyway, we all worked together and continued to, to follow up on all of this. And then as I was working with Peter Gatilla and still doing the research, we got a call from the show called Sightings, Henry Winkler. And I'd worked I'd worked on 
happy days. I kind of I kind of knew that family, you know. So we get a call from Henry Winkler and Andrea Maskey and John Tyndall wanted us to help them out with doing the show. Bigfoot, UFO, whatever we could help them out with. So we worked with them for quite some time and then Dorothy Isaac came up and, and John goes, can you get a hold of Dorothy Isaac? I said, well, I'm pretty good at doing that kind of thing. Let me see. So I found Dorothy Isaac up in British Columbia. And I began talking with her. As I was saying, she'd call me up at three in the morning and we'd talk for hours. So I talked with her and she became comfortable with the idea of doing sightings. So we did a show with Dorothy on sightings, the TV show. And she sent me a video. And I gave the video to Peter Gatilla. Then I introduced Peter to Dorothy over the phone. And we both, we all started talking and getting together the information for the book. And then that's how the book evolved. And then later, Frank Longo came along. Kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth because he really didn't do us right on that film. We gave him everything we had. And he did not treat us right. But he went ahead and did Capturing the Light which is a pretty good pretty good video, pretty good DVD, I think. Which is, that's how I first heard of Dorothy Is That, was through that documentary on Amazon Prime. I saw it and I thought, oh, I'll give that a try. I was like, this was a couple of, a few years ago, and I was just like, that's crazy. Like, like the, the, the foot... So for people who don't know, could you explain a little bit about... The, the the footage that Dorothy is that was capturing and how she was capturing it because it's well the, crazy in itself. Are you do you have are you able to put any of the, of the of the photos up so I can talk about them or can you do that on as well we're on? Uh, I don't I think explain. I can add the photos, but I can, I've got the photos in front of me. Ash has got also got the photos. Well, I'll, let me, I can explain basically what's going on. Uh, most of the photographs that you see, the still photographs, like the lady in white, like some of the interdimensional looking photos, much of the stuff that we that, that is in the book and that I have that's not in the book, that is taken off of one single frame of an eight millimeter film. Wow. Dorothy was using her husband's eight millimeter, eight millimeter camera like they were back in the 1970s. If you remember a little, you know, they had the wind up kind. And I mean, <laughs> they were little pieces of plastic, you know, she was doing all of her work with that. And what was happening that she would watch the footage and she would see a flash. She had no idea what the flash was. And so she wanted to analyze that. She had that analyzed and run through slowly with someone who could do that at one of the one of the uh, universities nearby, and they found that there were photographs on one individual frame of the eight millimeter. That's one eighteenth of a second that it was that it would take to put that onto that. That, that frame and there was no bleed over onto other frames it was just that one single frame so that's where we got the interesting photos the still photos that you see of things like the lady in white of the interdimensional there's one that i have that looks like a, an ocean and a beach and there's some kind of critter that looks like looks like nessie in the in the water there Alan yeah. Heineck saw that and said, that's got to be interdimensional. We're seeing interdimensional stuff. And that was all taken into the night sky. This was not taken near a beach where you'd see that. This was into the night sky. So all of that stuff that you're seeing is from the night sky, one frame on her video, on her, on her motion picture camera, 8 millimeter film. Now, some of the stuff that I've sent you, 
there are a couple of videos on there that also yes. occur in either one frame of the eight millimeter or very few two or three frames of the eight millimeter. So this is not like she took a major portion of this whole thing on eight millimeter that you're able to see in some of the videos, but that is captured from the video that I have that is taken from the eight millimeter. Okay. So I'm digitalizing about eight or 10 videos that Dorothy sent us to use. And on those videos that I'm now digitalizing, there are captures from the film that you're able to see that I sent you a couple of. A couple of yep. really are, are wild. I mean, the thing moves around unbelievably fast. Yeah. Somebody said the other day on, on uh, Dorothy Isaac project, they were talking with someone else, not me. They were saying, she just jiggled the camera. Well, explain to me how you jiggle a camera and get that on one frame of an eight millimeter. Yeah, and that, that's what they talk about in the documentary as well, which is one of the, the fascinating bits that, that I found, that they there's no way that anybody could reproduce something. And she couldn't shake her hand that quick to get one, essentially like one frame where it moves. And you can see the pattern of movement. It's, um, and that's what fascinated me about the whole footage on the documentary and what got me even to to come across your your twitter handle as the dorothy is that project and i was like boom we got we got to speak there's so much there's so much to the contact that she was having i am having and peter gatella is having that we were basically handed we were we were kind of she kind of passed us the torch and so I I sent you some pictures of things that I have photographed in the oh, night okay. sky. Cool. As well as things that Dorothy had. But I will get... I was on the phone with Dorothy one night and I said, what is this buzzing or this, this unequal pressure feeling that I get in my ears? And Dorothy goes, oh, oh, they're, they're wanting you to go outside. They're, they're trying to contact you. I went, okay, <laughs> cool. So what, what happens is that I will be sitting here and I get a sensation in my ears of, it's not really an actual pressure, but you know, when you, like, if you go into altitude or, or you know, you've, you've all had your ears stuff up for some reason or another, right? Okay. Probably aren't that many many mountains in UK that you can go up onto that <laughs> where your ears will plug up. But there are places here that I can go into and our, my ears will plug up. Well, it's not exactly that. It's not a physical sensation. It is a, it is a, it is a sensation, but it's not physical. It sounds as though one of my ears is not working properly as though it's plugged up but it's not. And sometimes I'll get a buzzing in my ear. And very often I get a tone. Like a G or a C. Or any, I've had my wife go to the keyboard and actually play the note that I'm hearing. I'll sing the note like, she'll go find out what that is. And it'll be a C or a G or an A or whatever. Or whatever. When I get this feeling in my ears, I grab my camera and I run outside in whatever quadrant of the sky I feel as though I should be pointing at, I point at and start taking photos. And some of the photos that I have sent you are ones that I have taken that are from those experiences that I have taken here in the skies over Kansas. And we've also gotten photographs in, in California. Uh, one of the things that, that has happened to me, Peter Gatilla and myself will be out on a site on a, on a sky watch. One night we were out and we all felt that there was 
light being type activity around us. Okay, I use light being because that's the easiest way to describe it. You may want to call it something else, but she called them light beings. And so, okay, light being is cool with me. Mm. But so we will we'll sense that something is in the area. So we tune in and want to you want to you want to you want to have an experience. You want to you want to clear your mind. Okay. It's called clearing. If you're into psychic phenomena or reading, you know that when you clear, you clear. You look at the gray behind your eyes. You want your mind to be totally devoid of any conscious thoughts and you want whatever is there to come into your mind freely without you subjectively adding thoughts okay so that's what you want to do when you're out looking at the sky and maybe you're saying light beings are you there will you please show yourselves which sounds kind of trite but that's kind of what we do you know talk to us so we're out one night in the high desert. We had the motor home out. We had the, the lean back chairs out so we can lean back and watch. All of a sudden, this light flashed from orbit, maybe. I don't know how high it was up. And it literally lit up the entire campsite for hundreds of feet around us. This thing was so bright and our take on it was that there was some there was some kind of a communication with the with the light beings or the other entities. Now you all of course you know that there there are the hard metallic craft that Dorothy would see. And yes. then there are the light beings which are more like the angelic beings that she would interact with. These beings would interact with her when she was outside, when she was inside. They would show her things on the ceiling of her bedroom. Okay. They would explain how she fit into the overall scheme of, of, the, of the history of the world. They would show her what is coming. They would show her how she fit in, into what is past. So they were basically teaching her. And NASA thinks they were trying to teach her a new language. On top of just showing her things, they were trying to literally teach her a language. So I guess that's that's kind of what we've all experienced being around Dorothy. We've experienced this kind of thing, this kind of interaction happening. We'll be at we'll be at Dorothy's and like, do you want to see a, what a UFO looks like? Oh yeah, let's see one. And here will come a UFO. That'll be the metallic UFO. So we can That'd be see... on command. What? That would be on like on command. She would be able to. She would. They, she would ask them to please show us one, or show themselves. Now you notice the, the the picture of the three aliens in the window. She said, "I can't see what you look like. Can I see what you look like?" And so they darkened the craft, and allowed the window to to be the brightest part of the of the whole seen and she was able to see the three aliens in the window so she was able to ask them to show her things and they would show her whatever she asked basically because they were trying they were trying to teach her so that she could share with the rest of the world what was happening and try to wake up the world literally try to bring us out of our of our low frequency where we're operating way too far, way too much these days. Look at all look at all the negativity going on, man. This is like a negative world, man. It's just like it's like you don't want to be there. Yeah, it's a dark time at the moment, isn't it? It's, uh... it's what she now what she believes, and you'll notice rather interestingly, all of the religions talk about going to the light or looking for the light. All of your major religions talk about that. Jesus himself talked about sharing the light, being in the light, let your little light shine, walking in the light, okay? Well, the light is where we need to be because light is a very high frequency. Dark is a low frequency. 
Negativity is very low frequency. Anger, hate, all of those are very low frequency. The light beings were trying to bring her to a higher frequency and get her to explain to all the rest of us idiots that we need to be operating on a higher frequency. So all of these good things will come to us. Instead of wallowing in the mud, <laughs> we want to be in a high frequency. So that's basically her message after, after all is said and done. The bottom line of the message is get your butts into a higher frequency, start loving and being happy and being a good person and doing good things for everyone and get this ball rolling because otherwise we're all going to go to hell in a handbasket. We're never going to advance. And that, that's know? the message that is quite common throughout people that have had these experiences or visitations or when they're took like somewhere with the, with the beings, it's always the mess, the same message of be good, be positive. And that's basically like a message to humanity is be good basically. And be positive. So it's always a very, very similar message across these type of experiences. Well, I, you know, I think you're right on. You're, you're, the line of thought is is right along with what Dorothy's, what we've come to learn after. And if you have you read the book, Contact no, with Being of Light. Oh, well, it doesn't say everything. If I had extra ones, those things go so fast, I can't keep. I can't keep them. But if I had one, I'd send you one. Just go online and order one and read the book because there's a lot that was said in the book that doesn't that is not said in the in the video. There's Remind us what the book's called. Contact with the beings of light. Okay, and you can get that all over the place. I, our publisher can't keep them in stock either, so basically what we do is just it only costs like nine bucks or something like that. Just. Go online to Amazon or whatever you want to. Just Google the book, Contact the Beings of Light, and it'll show up at several different places where you can purchase it. And it's well worth reading. You know, buy one and share it with you guys or something. Because it's well worth reading, sitting down and reading the book. Yep, there you go. That's it. Cool. That, now, that is, on the front of that book, that is, that is uh, the lady in white that you're showing. That's the lady in white. On the front of that book. Yeah. And I've got that right here. This is the original. So check this out. Oh, wow. And you sent us that photo as well, didn't you? I'm sorry? You, you sent us that photo as well. We've got we've got that picture. That's amazing. Yeah, this is, well, this is the original. Wow. From Dorothy. So she and took that, one. and that's, that's on one frame of video. One frame of photograph of eight mil. Mm. yes yeah that's the only way she was able to get this kind of a photograph is by taking it off of the single frame and when you when we did that this is what came out and what is amazing this photograph is evolving from this i'm trying to get it where you can see it yeah it's evolved from this that's the original to this so you can see it's already evolved and dorothy told us that no matter what medium these are shown on they will continue to evolve now that's right. a hard one to swallow <laughs> believe me it's hard to swallow but i've seen it happen on this picture from this to this so i i tend to believe Dorothy probably had it right. You know, they the, the light beings are able to do things that we don't understand, such as putting a, a, a one, such as taking one eighteenth of a of a second and putting a picture on a frame as it's rolling through the camera. You know, if they can do that, they must be pretty pretty cool. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, look, just uh, as a proof, there, I've just purchased the book. Oh, good. So, oh, wow. I'll How much was it? On Wednesday. $9.95? <laughs> no. It was um, £11.10. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's probably about $11 because it's rubbish. It's about oh, so $13. Yeah, pound is about a dollar, right? 
Yeah, not far off. It's probably about twelve dollars, something like that. Well, well, it's a little more than than I would have charged you. <laughs> if I had one, I would send it. I literally have gone through books so fast, and every time we do a show or something, they go so fast that I can't keep them in stock. So I don't have any books on hand right now. Actually, I have one book, one book right here. It's the only book I've got, and you know I. In fact, I've got the picture of it with, with that with that lady in white. He's actually on the front of the of the book. It's a hardback, so it's not a hardback, but it's a it's a glossy. So it came out very well. Now, what we want to do, our publisher actually wants to do an all color book. So we're working on doing that, but the problem with doing a color book is that you lose a lot in the translation because you don't see the videos so we want to do a new video as well that will show some stuff like i sent you today that they'll be able to see and i've got as i said i've got about eight or ten videos that are totally full of all of the dorothy material that that she sent us and that she had we've got some stuff with uh in her home where the light beings were actually appearing in her home. We've got video of that. We've got video of, she had a nativity scene set up in her home around Christmas time. The light beings were coming and hanging out around the nativity scene. And we've wow. got it on video. Wow, I'd love <laughs> to see that. Uh, you will. You'll see it. If, if nothing else, I'll send it to you specifically. Because as I go through these, what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm, I'm videotaping off of my monitor. So the videos that you're going to see that I sent you are that one that moves really fast and some of the other stuff that you'll see that I sent you. I only sent you, I think, maybe a couple of videos. Correct. But when you see those, those are videotaped off of my monitor. So when we get it down, when we, when we get it down to the last stages, and I've gotten it all on DVD, then we'll take all of that and put it onto a new video or DVD, which will be much higher quality. We just talked last night about how to go about doing that because I've got so much video, and one of the guys that I work with is in the Tupacabra. You may know Tupacabra from. Uh, okay, you know Tupacabra. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. He's one of the guys that did the show with last night. Okay. So Tupac Cabra is going to work with me on getting this out into video form and DVD form. So we're going to try to cut out some of the steps and get this all together so we can get this out so people can see it. Awesome. So that's our next, that's our next most important, most important project right now. Well, I'm going on and on. Have you guys got anything you want to talk about? <laughs> but I, I wanted to, to ask you had any thoughts on why Dorothy why do you think she was able to sort of communicate why they were showing themselves to her one more time I didn't catch that uh, so I wanted to ask you have any thoughts on why Dorothy why it's sort of her that who could capture and why they were showing themselves to her why it was basically Dorothy they came to yeah I, I have after having talked to Dorothy about it and after meeting Dorothy She's a very, very high frequency person all the time. She's always been that way from the time she was very young. She's always been very intuitive. She's always been very kind. She's had experiences that are similar to psychic phenomena or doing readings or, or whatever. She never was into the, the uh, what am I trying to say? not the ghostly avenues or doing the readings that have to do with that, with those entities, but she was open and listening to what her own psychic readings were telling her. So being open to that, probably as far as Dorothy and myself and, and Peter Gatilla and all of us, you know, talk about this all the time. I, we think that it was probably because she was so open and she was ready 
to receive what they were sending. And they found a willing person, a vessel, a willing vessel to fill with all of this knowledge. And they began filling her with all of this knowledge and then allowing her to photograph and videotape and whatever so she could share it with the rest of the, of humanity. That's, that's as good of an explanation as I can come up with. And I think that, I think it's probably right. I mean, intuitively, that's what it is. I think that's what it is. They, they, they found somebody who would share this and teach people. I think that's what she's doing. So did she, or did you ever find out or have any thoughts of who these light beings are and where they come from? The light beings are basically as you would think of angels, okay? If you want to compare them to anything that the human mind can can comprehend. Hmm. They're basically like angels who are able to be anywhere in the cosmos that they want to be. They are watching and trying to push us along without intervening it's very it's very comical they kind of had a star trek type mandate you know non-interference they want to help us get to a higher higher frequency and they want to help us be better to be able to reach ascension but they don't want to get involved hands-on so that's kind of that's why they appear to Dorothy and they will appear to those who are are ready to receive the information they have to offer and that's why you've got to be really at, at a very very high frequency in order to be able to receive what they've got you know you'd be surprised what you'll be able to receive if you if you clear your mind and you allow the good stuff to come in and kick the bad stuff out so you never can tell. You may have a light being experience yourself, but you've got to get in that frame of mind. And you've got to look toward doing just that. Hmm. That happening, I, I, I have no doubt that you'll have experiences of some, some kind of another. You may not have the exact experiences that Dorothy has, but you will certainly come in contact with higher frequency beings. Because I myself do it. And if an idiot like me can do it, there's no doubt you guys can do it. <laughs> I, just want, <laughs> I just want to before we come back to your experiences with the light beings i just wanted to touch on some of the like the nuts and bolts at like craft that are seen okay. so she's got the photo of these aliens or beings mm -hmm. from from the window so are they different to the light beings yes and what is their purpose? Are they similar that they're trying to help us progress, but standing off and guiding us? They're the, the, the aliens that we see buzzing around in the atmosphere, the hard craft, okay? Because there are hard metallic like craft that we see. There are craft that are light that we see. We only see the light. We don't see the hard metallic craft, okay? But the and I I've, I sent you one of a hard metallic craft that I photographed here in Kansas. Yeah. It's that UFO that's this that's there, kind of a dark. Then I then I also enhanced it. So I've yeah, got, I gave you the enhancement as well. Correct. Yeah, I got that, that. I'm just pulling that out now. That is a hard craft, and what those beings are, they are more as we are. They are flesh and blood creatures that are from another planet, from another realm, possibly even another dimension, but they are not the light beings per se. Dorothy, the three aliens in the window are like the, the beings that inhabit these craft that we see flying around. Right, the, okay. The aliens, the greys, Dorothy's feelings are that the... That the that the greys are kind of, uh, they're like an entity that is kind of a, a, bi a, a biological entity that is 
manufactured by the higher beings that like the like the uh the tall whites for instance the tall caucasians there are various aliens that we have all heard about for years and the tall whites are supposedly on a higher level than the the little grays the alien grays and the grays are more like the helpers that carry out the the commands and they will they will possibly go abduct a person and bring them to a craft that's what people people are seeing them in the in the room with them well the little grays are there to take them somewhere or they're there to observe any number of things that they're sent to do but dorothy's feeling is he also mentions this in the book is that the little grays that everyone sees are not the people not the ones who are in charge they're the worker bees more or less they fly the craft and they and they interact with humans but they're just the worker bees so the tall whites and the other aliens that are on a higher level maybe maybe more intelligent maybe not these are the people who basically tell the little grays what to do so we don't think that the grays are are entities unto themselves we don't think they're a race unto themselves we think they're a part of the other aliens that are higher frequency that are more intelligent does that kind of answer it without i was, yeah. I was kind of rambling but i hope i kind of got the point across you know it's hard to describe i mean it really is you, you got to put your finger on these these answers everyone is everyone is searching for answers and they're all talking about the aliens you know the grays and and the different ones that are there the european type and, and all that and to actually describe it when you have to come right down to telling you what they are it's kind of like uh well uh gee let me see <laughs> you know so try it sometime <laughs> you see what i mean anyway uh and now if if you watch you watch that video uh capturing the light and did you notice the alien the spacecraft go behind dorothy's daughter in the window in the kitchen that was one of the standout bits for me yeah well you know how that happened right we were filming got the video everything in in the can went back to vegas to look at the video look at the look at the footage and, and do the editing that's when we discovered that no one realized including the family or dorothy or the daughter that it was there we get back and we watch the footage and there it is so you'll see on the dvd when we took the footage back and showed it to the family the family's minds were blown that is when they first realized for the very first time that what dorothy had been saying all this time was real you notice the son was sitting there and his eyes could have popped out of his head when he saw that and i like the way that they tried to actually debunk it they went out into the garden they're saying where it was seen exactly it's like i can't remember the exact but there's no way any object could have been sort of there artificially if that makes yes. sense that it yeah it yeah it was something there yeah he went out trying to find out where how what that could have been yes you know, and once he got back to the house he said there's no way it had to be something flying by and so that's that's where they all kind of jumped on board now what we're trying to do is with dorothy's granddaughter jamie that i thank god recently got back in touch with jamie and us and Tupacabra and everybody, including yourselves, you want to be involved, whatever we're going to do, we're going to try to get the family to get back on board and not just want to make money out of this thing and, and try to sell a movie because they're not going to get it done. They don't have the connections to get it done. If it hadn't been for us bringing Frank Longo to them in the first place, capturing the light would never have happened. But the family is kind of trying to hang on to this stuff, and we want them to let us work with them, want them to work with us, 
so we can get this all out there, all of the stuff that we have. I've got a lot, but there's a lot more. She had roughly 30 to 35,000 feet of 8 millimeter. Yes. There's more. Okay. Can you imagine what, you know, if we can just get it all? But we need to get, when Frank Longo got involved, people got up, the family got upset with Frank Longo. And Frank Longo tried to keep Dorothy all to himself and make all of the contacts with other shows that wanted to do things. And so Frank Longo really did a number on everybody that was involved with Dorothy from the very beginning who really got the ball going. So we're trying now to recover the confidence of the entire family so we can get the rest of the material out to the public. Because if we don't get it out there, it'll just sit there and nobody will ever see it. Mm. Yeah. You know, I'm hoping that we're hoping that Jamie, the granddaughter and the daughter will get back on board with us and work to get all of this released to the public and get it all into a form that can be shown so we can get it out, whether we want to do a new book, a new movie, whatever we want to do, but we want to get them on board because that'll help a lot if we do. Awesome. You know, I've got enough stuff to show, but I'd like to have it all because there's, there's the more that Dorothy knew about what was going on than we've been able to show as of yet. So Put your, put your to, thinking caps on, guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I look forward to, uh, as I say, I, I'd seen the documentary, Capturing the Light, and obviously now ordered the book. Um, and it is, for people who haven't seen the documentary, I know, I know you mentioned about the documentary, but I, I found it, that was how I first heard of, of Dorothy and her video camera. Um, absolutely captivated. And that UFO going behind like the kitchen area right uh, and, and uh, she it, it moves across slowly it's not like a woof. it's a it just hovers across well it, um, it's doing like they like the light beings do all the time they're they're kind of like here i am look at me it was it was very much like look at me i'm in the yeah. background yeah i actually took that single frame and enhanced it and enlarged it I'll have to find that. If I find it, I'll send it to you. But that, Perfect. That craft is interesting looking. Okay. On the other hand, we have to remember, and I have to keep pinching myself, you know, pinch, to remind myself that I'm getting stuff too. So I've got to stay awake, and, and, and every time I get, I don't, I can't run out every time I get this, this, this feeling in my ears. I just can't do it. I, it happens too often. But I try to run out every time I get it. And you know, some of the stuff that I sent you, you'll see some of the stuff that I'm getting. So we're getting new stuff all the time. Hmm. So there is there is something called the hitchhiker effect, where yep. people who are close to other people who are experiencing it kind of, for want of a better phrase, it just sort of like disseminates out to, to people that are, are close by to the original person. It's something that they talk about at Skinwalker Ranch, that people who've been on site get these events happen right? completely off. So is that how you think it all happened with you? That Well, I know that what is happening with me as we speak is that we are continuing to have a kind of contact I haven't had it to the level Dorothy had it because I'm not seeing images on my, my bedroom ceiling yet, but I am getting contact with craft that are around me all the time. And when Peter and I get together, we really have stuff going on because we're synergistically connected. And when we're together, all kinds of stuff goes on that doesn't happen when I'm alone or Peter's alone. I sent you a couple of pictures that Peter took of me 
one I'm sitting facing away from the camera, and there is a big orb out in front of me. That's what happens every time Peter Gatilla takes a picture of me. Oh, that wow. orb is there all the time. So whatever that is, it's there. And then I also sent you, I work with frequency. I'm studying what happens when we alter the frequency of an area. And people are starting to clue in that frequency is the key to interdimensional contact. You, I think you're aware of that. You look like you are. So, it's, we, so we huh? just uh, to interrupt. We we talk to a lot of people from cryptids and Bigfoot to uh, ghosts, UFOs. Every, we cover the whole spectrum, and it's something that comes up a lot. And somebody we've spoken to, they talk about vibrations yes. and the fact that they're 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 different frequencies, and because they're not on the same frequency as us, they don't appear to us, and they can essentially change frequency and just appear, change frequency and disappear. Exactly right. Well, our eyes see at 19 hertz. So we're seeing in this 19 hertz range. However, when I take my frequency generator out to an area, and it's kind of like tuning a radio. You have to tune. I have a gigantic frequency generator that's, look, for my, my hand's wider than that, okay? It's like 24 <laughs> by 24. It's like this thick. It's got all kinds of frequency ranges on it. It's a laboratory style, lab, laboratory quality frequency generator. And what I will do is hook that into a, my large PV guitar amplifier that's got a lot of power. That sucker's, sucker's a huge PV amp. And so what I will do is I will run the frequencies through that amplifier, and that will change the vibration of an area. And I sent you pictures of orbs and other things that I have taken with the digital camera only visible when the generator is running. Okay. I can take the, I can take control shots of the area and nothing's visible. But then I tune my frequency generator on. I turn it on and get it to the right frequency, which is 525 hertz. It could be 123, 128, 110. I go through all of those different frequencies that are ancient frequencies that anyone can look up. But then there are frequencies in between. So I will look at those frequencies first and then i'll look between those frequencies so i can go digitally up or down from all of those frequencies and find a frequency that we get interaction with and i'll be taking pictures all the time and i will come to a frequency where i'm getting photographs so i'll stay on that frequency and photograph and i know that i'm not getting anything without the generator being on because I'm doing control shots and I'm debunking. So I know that what I'm getting is legitimately from the fact that my generator is operating and the digital camera is operating because I can't see these things with the naked eye unless the generator is on and I'm using the camera. It's the only way to capture them. So we're doing that. And I'm learning that there is something to the interdimensional thought that the thought that that frequencies will help us to eventually discover multi dimensions and be able to interact with them as I'm doing really, you know, I've got pictures you can see on there. I wish I wish I had a way of putting them up so I could talk about them. Cause I know <laughs> some of the orbs and things that I've gotten are from the frequency generator running and taking digital photographs. That one big orb that I sent you, it looks kind of like yep. the planet Mars. Yep. If you look, it's casting a shadow. So that's cool. And that's that. a two foot diameter orb that was off the ground about six inches. Wow. And it's next to a tree that's mm. about two foot in diameter. That orb is about two foot in diameter. And 
we also got at the same time on the other side of the tree, we got a very, very bright light, like a million candle power light that we couldn't see with the naked eye, but we got it on the, on the digital camera. And it was there. It was definitely there. We debunked that. There was nothing there to cause that simply because we had the generator running and we're photographing it. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm learning as I go. And I haven't got as much time as I would like to go out into the wild and do this. But I do it at home sometimes. And I have gotten some interesting things just around the home. So I'll keep you guys posted, you know, via direct message or whatever what i'm doing yeah yeah perfect yeah cool stuff all right awesome. I've, I've got one final question from me because you mentioned jay allen hynek i wonder yes. what what his thoughts were on this whole dorothy isaac thing on dorothy isaac he thought she was amazing uh i showed him that picture uh looks like the, the ocean and the beach with the little critter of whatever it is it looks like Nessie on the on the ocean. He said, This has got to be interdimensional. There's no way it's not. And so he he firmly believed that Dorothy was was in contact with light beings, firmly believed that she was on the level, totally on the level. You know he was at her house, right? We Good. got we took Alan to his to his her house. Oh well. Wow. And Stanton Friedman. Stanton Friedman was so overwhelmed that he not, he not passed out. Stanton Friedman broke out in a cold sweat and passed out. Wow. Woke him up later, like, what happened? What happened? What happened? Well, he missed he missed the whole thing. So these people who have a lot of knowledge, who are physicists, who are scientists, who have been dealing with the unknown with UFOs and, and all of this for years were overwhelmed by what Dorothy was showing them. Alan Hynek has no doubt Dorothy was totally on the level. In fact, you know that Alan took her cameras to his university. I think he was at Northwestern, wasn't he? I think he took I think he was head of, head of astronomy at Northwestern, I believe, Illinois. I think he, he, I know he took the cameras to the university. She used more than one camera. He took all of them and they were all working perfectly. So that's one good thing that Alan was able to contribute to the Dorothy Isaac thing. Yeah, because I know on the documentary, they, they talk about the fact that the cameras were tested and... right. If everything was fine. They couldn't find a fault at all. And it only seemed to happen when she was using the cameras, if I'm I'm sorry. Mistaken. It only happened when she was using the cameras as well. Yes, that's so right. It, and she could use someone else's camera and it would happen. But it wasn't the camera, obviously. You mm -hmm. know, so you know good old Dorothy Eyes at, you know. <laughs> the little gal, little grandma. It's, it's she's amazing. It going on. And grandma, she's when Grandma you Dorothy. see us, yeah, that's Grandma exactly Dorothy it. When, had it going on. <laughs> when, when you when you see the picture of her and you go, she's a sweet old little lady. Yes. No offense to her, but sweet old little lady. What? She's not someone that would you would think would even possibly try and oh. falsify this to the world. You know, you're looking. You're you're talking about the 1970s, okay? They didn't have any of the, of, the, of the stuff like Photoshop and all that. It didn't exist back in the day. And she was using that little bitty camera of hers, you know, the wind-up. She started off with a wind-up, and then she went to a battery operated later. And she was getting the same material. And she had the little little brownie. the one that, You see those pictures of the interior of the UFO that I sent you? You find those? Yep. Yep. Kind, of yeah, a yep. brown, kind of a brown color. But that shows the interior of the UFO. There are a lot of straight lines in it. And then you see the hands of the alien. I, I wish I'd have put them all, but I went through my, my photographs and I, I, I didn't have them all grouped together. I wish I had done that. But if you look through them, it's kind of a brown tone picture that shows the actual interior of a UFO. Just calling it up now. Yes. And yeah, that was it's... on her little brownie camera. 
I mean, so they would let her bring her camera on board, if you can imagine that. So wow. one, one last thing I'll leave you guys with. It sounds like you guys are kind of wanting to wrap up. One last thing I'll leave you with is that Peter Gatilla and I have had interesting things happen when we're watching lights in the sky, UFOs, whatever you want to call them, okay? Peter's had it happen individually, and I've had it happen individually. That one photograph that I sent you that was taken here in Kansas across the street from my home on the football practice field yeah. of that UFO, I thought I was there filming it and watching it at the very most three minutes. Very most. I didn't look at my watch. It shoots up into the sky in the blink of an eye. I mean, it was like gone. It was here and then it gone. Although I saw it when it reached the peak of its, of its climb, I saw that. I didn't see it go, but I saw it here and then I saw it here, which was 10,000 feet. This was 300 feet. Then I saw it here again. Nothing in between. I lost a good half an hour of time. Oh, wow. Because I thought I'd been out there for about three minutes. I got back in. I looked at my watch. This one right here. And I had lost 30 minutes. Wow. And I, th- I would have sworn to anybody. I would have put my stake my life that I was out there for three minutes. No, so what we do you have, think happened? Huh? What do you think happened during I don't that know. I'll probably have to be regressed in order to figure that out. But I know I know I lost the time. What what I, what happened in that time, I don't know. But I can tell you that Peter and I have have both had experiences where we'll be looking up at a UFO and then all of a sudden we'll be looking down at ourselves looking up at the UFO. Okay. That's happened to Peter Gatilla, and it's happened to me. And this, that is not a strange one to try to, to try to digest. I don't know what is. But that's happened on a couple of occasions to me, and it's happened on a couple of occasions to Peter. So there's interaction going on, and thank God to, for Dorothy to hand this down to me so I can continue. But I think we're going to have some more stuff going on, and you guys are on board. From now Absolutely. on. Absolutely. <laughs> I've got my seatbelt on ready. Oh, uh, yeah, you bet, man. <laughs> Wear your crash helmet, too. You're going to need it. Yeah, I think, so. <laughs> I think so. So where can – so people that are interested, where can they follow the project? Well, as you know, probably – that's probably how you found me. It was. the Isaac Project on, on Twitter. Uh, we also have – we also have a, a website on Facebook. I've got Kansas Bigfoot investigation on Facebook. And we also have another website that Peter Gatilla set up. And I'm trying to jog my memory. I haven't used that website for quite a while, but Peter puts a few things on there. Uh, what's the name of our, of our research group, Elaine? I can't remember. I'm trying to remember. I'll let you know. I can't. I can't, it's on Facebook, but Terry Albright and Peter Gatilla, we're both on Facebook. And what I will do on Dorothy Isaac Project, I will put some of the other websites on there. Perfect. For all the people that want to follow us other places. Perfect. But I'm going to be putting a lot of stuff on there. That's probably the best place. So Okay. Uh, that's great. So what we'll do is, I think at this moment, I think we could talk for hours and hours and hours. Oh, yeah, we, we and should. And I think... I think we need to do a part two for the listeners because I think they'll be as fascinated about everything as as certainly I and I know Ash has been. So we'll sort that out. But thank you so much. I know we it's taken us a little while to get to to the interview today. So we, well, we've had had to move some stuff last week. So thank you for your patience. Well, but yeah, both I, of us had issues. That we're trying to, you know, we've, yeah. I've been going. My wife's had cancer. We've been going through all kinds of traveling around the country. But, you know, yeah. 
we we managed to get together on it. I think we can do another one. So whenever you guys 100%. are ready, yeah. you know, I'll get some more stuff. So no, I'll get some more material. Yep. And I'll be sending that to you as I go. And then, you know, whether yeah. we do another show or not, I mean, it's totally up to you. I'd love to if you want to. But there's still a lot of a lot more material to, to be shared. So, yeah, we'd love that. I'll share it with you. Perfect. All right, guys. <laughs> thank you very much for your time, Terry. It's been absolutely fascinating speaking to you. So thank yeah, you. Cheers, Terry. Well, wait a minute now. I want you to check your legs. Do both of you have both of your legs? Yeah. I think so, yeah. I haven't stood up yet, but yeah. Oh, I've been known to talk people's legs off. So as long as you both <laughs> – you got your both – okay, good. We're good. All right, guys. <laughs> Thanks we'll a lot. We'll talk to you later, guys. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Pursuit of the Paranormal with Ash and Greg.